welcome to everyone who is coming into the webinar room. Um, give, it a, give it a few moments for everyone to uh, come in and grab your seats or whatever we want to call it. Um, yeah, so as folks are arriving into the room, thank you for coming to the second panel of Expanding Empathy 2024. Uh, this is the sixth year of the series we've been running through the Rock Ethics Institute. Um, the first year through the Consortium on Moral Decision Making, which is supported by Liberal Arts, Rock Ethics Institute, Social Science Research Institute, McCourtney Institute for Democracy, and the, the Department of Philosophy here at Penn State. Um, I'm excited. This year's theme we had we had a, a one a couple of weeks ago, and this is our second of three panels um, this year. And this year's theme is really about how we can bring together scholars from across psychology and philosophy to talk about <clears throat> to talk about empathy and morality as it applies to various real world ethical uh, applied issues. Um, and if there is a theme for this specific year, it's how we can use empathy and moral emotions to think about conflict and change. And I think the the, the three experts in the room today are, I'm really excited to see uh, how we sort of converge and complement each other. Um, so we have three speakers, uh, each of whom will go for about 15, 16 minutes or so. Um, after each talk, um, there'll be a chance for a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, if you're in the audience and have a question, feel free to drop it in the Q&A feature at the very bottom, and we'll try to get to them as soon as we can. Um, afterwards, there'll be about 45 minutes to an hour where we have sort of back and forth dialogue, chances for the speakers to talk to each other, and also um, any further questions you all have. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited today. I think there's a lot of natural overlap and a convergence between the speakers we have here. So let me get started. So I'll introduce first uh, Dr. Linda Skitka, who's Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She's previously the president of the Society for Personality and Social Psychology in 2019, uh, the main social psychology organization, um, and also the Midwestern Psychological Association in 2018 and received the Distinguished Service Award from SBSB in 2016. Uh, Linda received the Harold Laswell Award for Distinguished Scientific Contributions to Political Psychology in 2016 from the International Society of Political Psychology, and received a PhD at UC Berkeley. Grants from the NSF, the Templeton Foundation, NASA, and in her talk today, she'll focus primarily on a lot of her work on the psychology of moral conviction, and how attitudes that have moralized component can be different and have different results than uh, those that aren't so moralized. So it's great to have you here uh, to kick off today's panel. And so thanks, Linda. Well, thank you for that kind of um, introduction and thank you for the invitation to participate today. Let me share my screen. Um, as Daryl um, shared with you, I'm gonna be talking to you today about the social and political implications of moral convictions. Um, and first, I just want to start with the broad question is, what is morality? Um, we, we have many different people who, and scholars who have thought about this question. Um, but often it seems that, that lay people, are, um, and many, maybe even if scholars, think that, um, that it's an inherent property of some issues or judgments, that some things are just moral and kind. Um, but as psychologists, I would like to ask a question instead, is it instead a meta-perception that perceivers have about certain issues, judgments, and choices? Um, and so let me define what I mean by uh, meta-perception. Um, a perception could be this, like, what is my attitude about X? Do I support or oppose, um, for example, um, legalized abortion in the United States? Um, so that's your perception. Um, a meta-perception is, what do I think, feel about my attitude about X? Um, what thoughts or um, perceptions do I have of my attitude? Um, and one thought might be as this particular attitude is a moral attitude. Um, and if morality is a meta perception or can be a meta perception that people have about attitudes, um, then we should find individual differences in moral conviction, even for normatively moral issues. Okay, that some people may bring to bear that perception about an attitude and other people may not. Um, so this line of work that I've been doing, instead of starting out with a theory of what morality is or what moral attitudes are, um, a researcher or theorist-driven approach, instead I've been taking an inductive and bottom-up approach and letting participants tell us what they think is moral 
to them and seeing what the consequences of these meta perceptions of, as, of an attitude as a moral one has for people's thoughts, feelings, and behavior. Um, we have a very simple operationalization of capturing um, moral conviction. Is this asking people how much is your position on any given issue? A reflection of your core moral beliefs or convictions and based on fundamental questions of right and wrong. We can add additional items to, um, to try to inventory this, but it actually doesn't bring a lot more new to the table, even with these two items that um, you have incredibly high reliability. Um, and consistent with the idea that there would be individual differences um, in the perceptions that an attitude is a moral one, um, even on normative issues that we normatively see as being moral ones, um, even um, people's position about abortion in the United States um, varies in a nearly normal distribution. Okay, some people do not see it as having nothing to do with their moral beliefs um, or convictions, and other people see it as maximally, and as well as everywhere in between. And we see similar distributions for um, across the many, many other issues that one might see, believe that people, everybody sees as moral. Um, and we've also developed a domain theory of attitudes to, to derive hypotheses about how and why attitudes um, differ in terms of these meta perceptions. Um, some attitudes are preferences. Um, that is, they're matters of taste. Um, they're subjective and they're very tolerant. For example, um, I might really love broccoli. It's okay if you don't. Um, but I, even my position about abortion could be a preference. I might prefer for it to be um, legally accessible or not, but not have any other kinds of um, associations with that particular attitude. Other attitudes will fall in the domain of conventions. Um, these are based on normative standards of beliefs. Um, this is what people within my group tend to believe, and therefore I believe it too. Um, oftentimes, these are coordination rules. Um, for example, we might use the words right and wrong to describe um, driving on the right or left side of the street. Um, but by that, we mean it's normatively wrong. Um, this is not how we do it in our, in our country. And we think it's perfectly fine if people in other countries decide to coordinate their behavior in another way. Um, a special characteristic of these are is that they tend to be very authority and group dependent. It, um, Attitudes in this domain are what people in my faith community believe, or that what people within my group believe, or what authorities tell me to believe. And they're often codified by law, uh, law, and they're very narrow. They apply to our group, but we don't impose them on other groups. Um, and so again, one, one person's um, position on abortion could be based more on conventions. This is what people in my faith community believe. Um, it's okay if people in other faith community, communities believe something different. And also, if my church authorities in my group um, were to reverse this position, I probably would reverse my position as well. And then um, some people's position on issues are perceived as moral imperatives. And we hypothesize that these have a number of characteristics, um, that these are going to be seen as more absolute and universally true than attitudes that are preferences or conventions. They're going to be perceived pretty much like facts, um, you know, that this is uh, that, that there's a morally correct answer to this one is as obvious to procedures as one plus one equals two. And unlike conventions, these are very authority independent. Um, it doesn't matter what authorities or even the group has to say about this issue. I know what is right or wrong um, on its own. And I will stand up to authorities and groups that um, disagree with me about it. it. Has ties with strong emotions. Um, they're uniquely motivating, um, resistant to change, and they're intolerant. Um, we don't like people who don't share our position and, and attitudes that we perceive that are in this domain. And so I'm going to um, share some research evidence um, about each of these hypotheses, or the tests each of these hypotheses. I won't have time to go through all of them, um, but I can share that um, there is research support for each of these hypotheses. The, um, what I'm going to be focusing on first is just um, the idea that moral convictions are uniquely motivating. Um, the first time we actually tested this hypothesis was way back in the 2000 election. Um, people might remember there was a period where there was an impasse where we didn't know who won, Bush versus Gore. And what we had um, collected was directions and strength of party identification. So how strongly do you prefer, um, um, I'm sorry, um, do you identify with your party? Direction and strength of their candidate preference. Okay, so how strongly do you prefer your candidate versus the other candidate? And the moral conviction associated 
associated with people's candidate preference. And finally, um, whether they self-reported voting in the <clears throat> in the election. Um, this is predicting the odds of voting in the election. Um, we've first put in some demographic controls, and then we're putting in all these, um, you know, which candidate did you prefer, but um, most importantly, the strength of um, your candidate preference and your strength of party identification. Um, usually um, party identification is explaining taking a very big load in, in terms of um, voting or not. Um, and as you can see, both of these um, variables increase the odds of voting. Um, but even when controlling for these variables, letting all those other variables eat up as much variability as they could, um, strength and moral conviction about one's candidate preference nonetheless still predicted um, in voting in the two, um, 2000 election. We have replicated this with, um, again, with um, people's moral convictions about their candidate preferences, but also people's moral convictions about hot button issues in, in an election cycle. And moral conviction consistently uniquely predicts um, variability in you know, voting intentions, actual voting behavior, and so on. Um, we find similar kinds of things in terms of people's willingness to get involved in um, activism related um, to some belief. So the more that you're Oh, and actually, I should go back to the election um, data. One more thing I want to just emphasize, that there were no differences as a function of whether um, voters were on the right or left and the degree to which moral convictions increased people's likelihood to vote. And we've also done a large meta-analysis now over many, many studies. And the effect size for um, ideological differences and explaining moral conviction effects is essentially zero. Um, so this is an activism um, study in the context of same-sex marriage. This study was conducted in the window of time in, when, in which several states have legalized um, same-sex marriage, but others had not or, or had officially banned it. Um, we had equal numbers of participants from states where it was legal versus illegal. Um, so um, whether activism was therefore in support of or against the status quo. And we had uh, approximately equal numbers of um, supporters of same-sex marriage and opponents to same-sex marriage. Um, this is a somewhat complicated graph, but let me just walk you through it. Moral conviction, this line that says 0.28, directly predicted activist intentions um, in the context of same-sex marriage. There were no um, moderating effects as a function of whether you were pro or con um, the issue or whether you were resisting or um, supporting the status quo. These effects were mediated by um, perceived benefits of one's preferred policy on same-sex marriage. Um, the more morally convicted you were, the more um, beneficial you thought your outcome, preferred outcome on same-sex marriage was, um, which in turn was associated with um, activist intentions. Very interestingly, for some theories of morality, um, there was no mediation effect for the anticipated harms of one's non-preferred policy. Other meters were um, in strength of anticipated regret at failing to get involved and the um, anticipated pride at becoming involved. <clears throat> um, we did a near exact uh, replication of this conceptually with a, another issue and that is concealed carry on college campuses and found exactly the same pattern of results. <clears throat> um, so these studies and others like them um, are consistent with the idea that, idea that moral convictions are motivational that they um, promote people becoming involved. Um, moreover, it, um, they seem to be promoting people to become involved um, in behaviors that generally are conceived as social goods. Um, political engagement is, is important in democracies and political systems. Um, and so anything that increases participation in these efforts would seem to be a pretty good thing. <clears throat> However, um, is there a dark side to moral conviction as well? Going back to our <clears throat> theory, um, one prediction about moral convictions is that they are um, they lead people to be especially intolerant of those who disagree. Um, <clears throat> to test this idea, um, we ask people um, a number of indices of attitude strength about a number of different issues, specifically abortion, legalizing abortion, capital punishment, legalizing marijuana, and building new nuclear power plants. Um, and we wanted to predict um, people's de degree of social distance towards people who would disagree with them about this issue. 
So we asked them how happy or unhappy they would be to have someone um, play a number of different social roles in their lives who disagreed with them about abortion, capital punishment, marijuana, nuclear power. Um, and these roles might be marry into your family, um, as a personal friend, as a teacher to your children, um, the owner of a store you might frequent, and so on. Um, and as I did in the previous study, we entered a, um, a, a bunch of controls. First, um, demographic variables, <clears throat> strength of political orientation. Um, but we're also controlled for a number of other meta perceptions that might pe people might have about attitudes. Um, there might be alternative explanations for my, why moral conviction might be related to other variables, specifically attitude extremity, importance, and certainty. So once again, we let them all these other variables eat up as much possible variance and social distance as they could, and wanted to see if moral conviction added anything additional. In all four cases, it did. Um, the more morally convicted you were, um, the less happy you would be to have someone who disagreed with you play any number of social roles in your life. Um, we also replicated this, um, or did a conceptual replication of this, using physical um, distance as a dependent variable instead of self-report. In this study, we brought people into the lab um, and told them that we were interested in studying um, how people get to know one another and the role that gossip plays in this um, process. And participants were told that they were going to be randomly assigned to get inside information about who they were about to meet. And all participants were assigned into the condition where they will get information. Um, they then um, basically took, took a slip of paper out of a hat um, which were supposed to be snippets of information that we had gleaned about who they were going to meet from um, a previous mass testing exercise. And that they learned that the, who they were about to meet was, was on the top of the scale in terms of pro-choice on abortion. They were then escorted into a different room where they were going to have this get to know you exercise happen and where they encountered a backpack that had a pro-child, pro-choice button on it. Um, a coat was actually draped over the chair and there was a coffee cup on the floor, um, but there was no other person there. Um, and so the experimenter goes, oh my, where is the other participant? They must have wandered off to go to the restroom. Um, you know this building. They might get lost. I better go find them. While I go do that, why don't you take a chair from that stack over there and make yourself comfortable? Um, the experimenter then leaves. And by the way, the idea of getting lost in our particular building, which was built on a theory of rotating squares, is completely plausible. Um, the experiment leaves um, for a couple of minutes to allow the um, real research participant to get settled, comes back and goes, well, ah, there's no other participant. We're really interested about where you put your share. And they're fully debriefed about the purposes. And what you can see here is that when um, the other participant's position was similar to the research participants, um, participants placed their chair closer um, to who they thought they were going to meet than they did if they, if they had high moral conviction than if they had low moral conviction. Um, conversely, um, people with higher moral conviction about abortion sat further away from someone who they believed had a dissimilar attitude on abortion than they did um, than, than those who had lower moral convictions about abortion. And the attraction effect um, was weaker than the repulsion effect, okay? Again, evidence that's suggesting that people are um, intolerant and want social distance and physical distance from those who disagree with them about morally convicted issues. Um, stronger moral convictions also predict acceptance of lying um, to achieve a morally preferred end, acceptance of violence and the same. Um, it is associated with authority independence. People don't care what authorities or fellow group members really have to say about the matter. Um, and an unwillingness to compromise or um, accept procedural solutions to conflict. Um, <clears throat> so there does appear to be a bit of a dark side to moral convictions as well, um, especially in terms of um, the increased willingness to accept violence, both in terms of um, interconflict, like in work time situations and acceptance of um, collateral damage, as well as vigilante justice. So I would argue that we gain new insights by using um, a more inductive approach to studying morality by asking people what they think is moral and then seeing what the associations of that, those perceptions are. I just want to quickly thank my collaborators. <clears throat>
and thank you for listening. Thanks, Linda. That was wonderful. Um, so we have a time for a few minutes for questions. If anybody in the audience, again, um, please use the uh, Q&A function in the bottom there to ask any questions. Um, <clears throat> While we're waiting for any to roll in, um, I don't know if Maddie or Evan, not to put anyone on the spot, if anybody had any, if any of the other panelists had any questions they wanted to raise. Um, Maddie? Uh, so I'm really, first of all, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm really interested in the idea of letting participants define what they mean as moral. And I know you kind of talked about this in the context of which issues they thought of as moral, but I'd love you to talk a little bit more about like what that methodology looked like. This is something I'm doing in the context of um, moral consideration at the moment. So it'd be yeah, be very cool to hear from you. Um, we quite literally just asked them to what extent are your feelings about this a reflection of your core moral beliefs and convictions? So it was very direct. Case valid measures. Thank you. Uh, Linda, I'm curious if you think that there's this sort of dark side to moral convictions. Um, it, uh, it seems like the solution could be have fewer moral convictions, right? We should just have the right moral convictions. So, I mean, how are you thinking about um, what maybe we could do about this uh, problem, this challenge that seems to be raised by the fact that, you know, moral convictions ha uh, have this dark side? Um, that's really a terrific question. Um, you know, and it, it's a question I get sometimes. It's like, does that mean we really should get rid of moral convictions? Um, and I would say no, um, um, because no social change would occur, I don't think, um, without people who are willing to incur the cost and stand up and defy authority, defy current systems and law, and so on, um, in an effort to create social change. So we need moral convictions to help people override the normal resistance to confronting all those costs that might that are barriers to social change. But on the other hand, um, yes, there really are dark sides. Um, and but how dark you perceive them to be depends on whose ox is getting bored, right? You know, an American revolutionary was no doubt seen as, you know, that was bad um, on the part of the um, British, but they're seen as heroes on the part of Americans. Um, so the bad stuff really depends on whose team is being challenged, so to speak. And so the very same moral convictions could be seen as heroic and martyrdom um, by one set of perceivers, but as um, terrorism um, by another set of perceivers. And the difficulty is who gets to make the um, calls and balls and strikes on which one it really is. So that nicely dovetails with a couple of questions. I'm going to try to, there's a, a lot of really good ones here in the q and A. I'm going to try to integrate across a couple of them. Um, so Jason Lamb had a nice question about lowering convictions and depolarization, which kind of builds on Evans, I think. But also Karina Schumann has a question about, can people who are high in moral conviction also be open-minded to different views? How do you balance intellectual humility to, in this sort of context? Those are also great, <clears throat> really great questions. Um, we are, my current research efforts are really directed towards understanding attitude moralization, what leads people to dial up, and also attitude demoralization, what leads people to dial down. Um, the preliminary answers to that one is consequences are not the driving factors. Um, it's all emotion. And dialing up and down um, emotions attached to um, these issues. And um, and surprisingly to me right now, it does not appear that the processes, processes of attitude moralization are different than those of attitude demoralization. Um, it's amping up the same positive versus negative emotions and dampening the same. Um, and the second question was, Daryl? The second question was basically how just balancing humility with um... Oh, yes, yes, yes. Convictions. Um, now, I want you to keep in mind that we're, what we're measuring here is not an individual difference variable. There are not people that are high and low in moral conviction, um, although that may be true in the wild. Um, but what we're capturing here is the moral significance people attach to a specific issue. 
So I would not expect that moral convictions would be correlated with other individual difference variables um, any given issue for any given issue. Um, which maybe is why we don't find um, political orientation um, relationships with moral conviction either, because these are idiosyncratically attached to specific issues, right? Um, now, what we have been trying to do is actually do things like um, instill some humility or let people engage in perspective taking about the issue, okay? Um, and to date, um, we're, we're still just, this is an ongoing say that we just started the semester. Um, and I would say right now, I'm not sure we've been successful at getting people to take somebody else's perspective. Um, I was hoping to have some preliminary data to share with you, um, but doing it over the weekend is like, I'm finding a whole bunch of nothing. Um, but I think that those efforts are, are worth um, looking into. And I think some of the same um, interventions that do help with depolarization are likely to um, help um, get demoralize as well. So I'm going to try to integrate a couple more questions quickly before we move on to the next speaker. There's a lot of great ones here in the in the chat. Um, Linda Trevino is asking about how we relate these findings to empathy. Um, and it melts me sent us a nice question about the role of anticipated harm and how that's not really playing a role in the 2017 study. And I'm integrating them because it, you know, it's interesting to think about as we think about balancing convictions and humility and trying to perspective take and have empathy in some of these challenging contexts. Like, for example, the coming upcoming election, which Paul Conway asked about, um, how we think about the role of managing moral convictions and empathy, and how we think about, um, you know, shaping our moral emotions, how, how we decide how to leverage our moral convictions in these spaces. And so I think I'd be curious for the sake of the for the broader you know empathy series how do you how do you see this playing out in the with empathy and how do you think about the role of anticipated harm and how we manage our moral convictions yeah in terms of agreeing to participate in um, the seminar series I have to confess I don't have I certainly don't have any data on empathy um, in these contexts um probably because my intuition is is that people are are going to be very resistant to um, empathizing with those who disagree with, agree with them in, in this space. When they have strong moral convictions, again, that um, I think maybe they'll be tolerant uh, to have a conversation and try um, to talk to somebody who has a, a, an opposing view. But if they don't get that person to soften or to flip their position, um, I think the psychology of this is that then they have to just say, well, that person is functionally evil. They're out, you know, the sort of are out there that I can't engage with them, which is something that we've been seeing a lot with, with um, current contemporary American politics, that people won't date people um, who are supporting the opposing party's candidate, you know, that they're really rejecting each other. Um, and I do think that's because our, we're living at a particularly highly moralized political time. Um, the harm findings are really interesting, but, um, that particular study and a, a close replication of it did not find any role for harm. Um, other studies such as, um, um Feinberg's study on meat consumption does find roles for consequences, um, and the attitude moralization. Um, so the, the evidence there is a little bit mixed and, Part of what I'm wondering about is if harm may play a role in helping to switch something like, like a preference into a moral conviction, like a hedonic preference for meat consumption. You might really need a lot of arguments and you know, a lot of, a lot of cognitive deliberation to move a preference all, all the way over to a moral conviction. Um, however, for an issue that at least has some moral recognition, um, for example, a recognition that at least others see it in the moral light, um, or that some recognition that it could be moralized, the processes might be moral amplification instead of basically moral recognition. And there all you need to do is stir in some um, really strong emotions. And it might be messages about harm, but it isn't the consequences itself that's driving the process. It is those emotional reactions in terms of um, anger, disgust. Um, but we also have found important roles for enthusiasm. Um, for increasing moral convictions as well. 
So there, there are plenty of additional questions. Um, I think we can we can hold these and come back to them during the discussion. Um, I mean, this this work is incredibly fascinating. I mean, I've always appreciated your insight about you know with like the trolley dilemmas. How, why should we assume everybody moralizes them in the same way? You're actually asking them the ideographic approach to moral psychology. I think is really important and influential. And um, I mean, the harm findings. The harm finding is really interesting. We actually we have some data. We published a couple of years ago, finding that people who say they have moral convictions about particular issues are more likely to choose to cultivate moral outrage on behalf of those issues. And so there's this interesting question of the ease of cultivating these moral emotions when we are faced with, when we have a strong conviction about them. And so, um, yeah, it's definitely really uh, influential and makes us think about how we manage moral emotions in things like the upcoming election cycle. And if we didn't get to questions that people were interested in, um, feel free to email me. I'm very easy to find on the internet. My name's Ariane Usual. Well, well, thank you, Linda. Um, let's go ahead and shift gears um, over to uh, Maddie Wilkes, and I'll go ahead and introduce Maddie. Um, so Maddie is a lecturer, uh, assistant professor of psychology at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, uh, where she runs the Altruistic Minds Lab. Uh, her work focuses on the social developmental psychology of moral motivation, um, and as a lot of her work is focused on how people shape and expand their moral circles, their circles of regard, and how they focus on the morality of uh, beings like animals in comparison to humans. Um, she did her PhD at the University of Queensland and did postdocs at the Princeton Center for Human Values in the Department of Psychology at Yale, and is published in some of the field's top journals, including developmental psychology and psychological science. Um, I think the questions about how we think about the moral circle and how our motivations can shape and contract uh, what we think is worthy of empathy and moral concern is a fascinating one. Um, and yeah, I think the topics, one reason I brought together these scholars, I think there's a lot of interesting connections between how we think about what we're currently convicted about and how we expand the circle to change those convictions. So whenever you're ready, Manny. Okay, I'll get started. Um, so yeah, I'm a lecturer or assistant professor in psychology at Edinburgh, and I'm going to be talking to you today about my research on variability in the moral circle. Um, so the moral circle, I think, has been touched on a little bit already today, but just uh, for the sake of definition, it basically is a philosophical concept that helps us to determine who we do and don't think of, sorry, as define who we do and don't think of as worthy of moral concern. So beings that we think of as worthy are inside the circle, and beings that we think of as unworthy are outside. Um, and there's been a long history of, of this dis discussions of the moral circle in philosophy. So for example, here, uh, Peter Singer argues that our moral circles have been expanding across time. Um, and in, I would say in the last 10 to 15 years or so, there's also been quite a lot of interest from psychologists in trying to measure and really understand individual differences in people's moral circles. And just as a quick note, while, while the moral circle is typically spoken about in, as a binary, I think it actually makes sense to think of it more as a gradient. So beings that are closer to the center of the circle are those that you grant the most moral consideration to, and it kind of uh, expands outwards that way. Uh, so something similar to the picture that you see on the screen. Uh, so as I mentioned, psychologists have been very interested in measuring and understanding our moral circles. Um, and I think one of the seminal papers in this field is Charlie Crimston and colleagues' development of the moral expansiveness scale. So this scale uh, captures individual differences in the moral circle. And basically, they just ask participants to rate their moral consideration for a whole range of different entities, as you can see on the screen there. Um, and that's kind of an overall pattern of what a moral circle looks like there with your friends and family at the center. And then um, as you go further out, you have all of these different groups. Um, we've also, this, this is kind of associated with things like empathy and compassion, but shown to be distinct. And it also predicts things like your willingness to volunteer your time or donate money to help others. I was also fortunate enough to be involved in a replication of this where we developed a moral expansiveness scale for children. So this was led by Carrie Neldner. Um, and here we see children show similar kinds of patterns in their moral circle um, as pictured in, in that photo there. But while that's what an overall moral circle looks like, there's actually quite a lot of variability in the moral circle. So in recent work, Josh Rotman and colleagues um, kind of broke down the moral circle into different ways. So they split their sample into people who were identified as human lovers. So these are people who put um, human outgroups, uh, grant more moral concern to human outgroups than, than they do to animals and nature. And then also into tree huggers. And so this was a proportion of the sample, about 30%, that grants more moral consideration to animals and nature than they do to human outgroups. And what I think is really cool about this work is if you look at it overall, both of these groups uh, grant the same amount of overall moral consideration. So their scores on this moral expansiveness scale would be very similar, but it's where they're actually directing their moral consideration within those judgments or within the scale that uh, varies 
So if we know that not everybody's moral circles look the same, I think it raises the question of, you know, which factors do then shape our moral circles? Which kinds of factors are relevant when we're making these moral concern judgments? I think, putting it simply, we can break it down into target factors and judge factors. So target factors are factors about the entity that you're judging. So what is it about the pig or the dog or the person that has an impact on your moral judgments? And judge factors are factors about the person making the judgment. So me or you or whoever is making this judgment. Historically, the field has had a very heavy focus on target factors. So for example, we know that we think of beings that are, we grant more moral concern to beings that we see as beautiful, as having mind or intelligence, as being similar to humans. Um, and then we grant less moral concern to beings that we see as harmful or that um, have potentially behaved in an immoral way. And just to flag, this is a very rich field. So the references and the list that I provide here are not exhaustive, but just to kind of give you a taste. But this raises the question, what about judge factors? And this is something that the field has uh, spent relatively less time looking at so far, um, but something that I think is really important. And so I was fortunate enough to be approached by, approached by Bastian Jaeger, who's an uh, assistant professor at the University of Tilburg. And he came to me and said that, you know, let's look into how much of the moral circle is actually accounted for by each of these factors, the target and the judge. So to do this, we had participants from Australia, the UK and the United States um, rate the moral consideration that they felt towards a whole range of different animals, as you can see down the side there. Um, and Bastian ran basically a cross-classified multi-level model that included random effective participants of the targets and the interaction. And this basically gives you an interclass correlation coefficient, which basically quantifies how much variance is explained by each factor. So it doesn't tell you specifically which factors are important, but just how the overall variance breaks down. And so here's what we can see. About a third of the um, variance is accounted for by the target. About a third is the judge, and about a third is the interaction between the two. And this pattern is very consistent across countries as well. So we can see this in Australia, the UK, and the US. Now, this might not sound that surprising, of course, you know, maybe about a third makes sense, but if you think about this in the context of the field, which is really heavily focused on the target up to, to this, uh, up until now, it suggests that the field may be neglecting in some ways some, some really important variants that does shape these kinds of judgments. So that brings me to my interest in judge factors. Um, and so while I said there hasn't been much work, there has been some. Uh, I think some of the most uh, influential work in the field has been Adam Waits and colleagues work on political orientation. So in this study, um, the authors basically looked at the moral circle um, of people who were either on the political left or the political right, so liberals and conservatives, um, and they used a number of different measures. So I think there were six, three or four studies in there, and they used many different proxies for moral consideration. But just to give you some examples, um, here we can see you've got conservatism across the bottom. Here you can see with increasing um, rates of nationalism, sorry, increasing conservatism is associated with increasing rates of nationalism. And again, increasing conservatism is associated with a reduction in universalism. So here they, they're used as a proxy for moral expansiveness. So this is a really interesting judge effect. Basically, the more conservative you are, the less uh, morally expansive you tend to be. They also found what I think of as a really interesting target by judge interaction. So again, here you can see with greater levels of conservatism, um, conservatives grant less moral consideration to non-humans, but they also grant more moral consideration to, to humans. And so it's not just a matter of whether you're conservative or liberal making the judgment, but it's also about which kind of entity you're making a judgment about. So I think this is a really neat example of an interaction. So as a developmental psychologist, I've been really interested in another judge factor, and that's what I'm going to spend the rest of this um, presentation talking to you about. So I'm particularly interested in age and how children's moral circles might differ from adults. And I think when we think about moral consideration, uh, there's likely to be a lot of consistency in the beings that are kind of at the center of the moral circle. Pretty much everyone I know grants most of their, grants high rates of moral consideration to their immediate friends and family. I think where we're gonna see more variability is in these kinds of fringe uh, beings. So beings that might not already be granted for moral consideration or things where there might be a lot of controversy around them. So I'm interested in moral consideration for distant others. I've looked at this in three contexts so far. So people are in, the first is with distant people. So people who are maybe physically or socially distant from you with non-human animals and also with artificial intelligence. And I'm gonna to speak to you mostly about the first two today. So uh, let's talk first about distant people. So this study was motivated by Peter Singer's uh, child drowning in the pond scenario. Uh, so for those who aren't familiar, it's basically if, you've, if you come across a child who is drowning in a shallow pond, you know that you could save this child by walking in and um, pulling them out, but you'll destroy your new $50 shoes, should you do this? And of course, everybody says yes. And then the question goes on to say, well, if that's the case, why, why is that different than donating that $50 to help save a child's life when they're dying of a preventable disease in another country? And so it raises this question of how important is distance in our moral, shaping our moral obligations to others? 
So my collaborator, Julia Marshall and I were really interested in looking at these intuitions. Um, so we presented children and adults with stories about these dyads. And we either told them that these dyads lived physically close to one another so they could walk to get to one another, or that they were physically distant. They had to fly to get to one another. And we also manipulated social distance. So we said they either listen to the same music, play the same games and eat the same food, or um, have different food, different music and play different games. And then we just asked them, okay, if one of these people needed help, would the other person have to help them? So do they have an obligation? And here's what we find. So you can see very clearly a strong age effect. So I should say here, younger children are five to seven, older children are seven to nine and then adults. And what we can see very clearly is that younger children think that we're much more obliged to help people compared to older children and adults. We also fit Bayesian mixed effects models and we found evidence that younger children were credibly less distinguishing on the basis of physical distance than were older children and adults. So this basically means that younger children think we're equally obligated to help someone regardless of whether they're physically close or distant from us, whereas older children and adults do not. They think we're more obligated to someone who's physically close to us. We also see a similar pattern for social distance. Um, so this time we found differences. We've seen the same strong age effect, but this time we found that both younger children and older children think that we are less, uh, sorry, think that we're equally obligated to help socially close and distant others, whereas adults think that we're less obligated to help someone who is socially distant. So when thinking about this in the context of the moral circle, it really suggests that compared to adults, younger children, and in some cases, older children are more likely to put these distant beings closer to the centers of their moral circle. We've also looked at this in the context of non-human animals. Um, so in this study, Lucius Caviola, the co-lead and I, presented children and adults with dilemmas that involved sinking boats. And we told them, both of these boats are sinking and you can choose to save just one. On one boat, there's one person. On the other boat, there's one dog or two dogs, or 10 dogs, or 100 dogs. We also did the same with pigs and we increased the numbers of people. So they saw all possible combinations here. And here's what we find. So for dogs, here are the adult responses. So you can see across the bottom, um, all the different potential combinations. So um, all the scenarios and up the side is the proportion of participants that gave each response. So overwhelmingly adults are choosing to save the person in almost every dilemma that's present, represented by the green color um, and hardly ever choosing to save the dog or saying they can't decide in yet yellow and gray. By contrast, children are choosing to save the dog when there's more dogs in the scenario and they're choosing to save the person when there's more people in the scenario. So it seems like children are more interested in saving the larger number of entities, whereas adults are more interested in saving people regardless of how many entities are in the dilemmas. We see a very similar pattern here for pigs, um, except in these cases, pigs tend to, uh, there's a slightly more tendency to prioritize humans over pigs for both children and adults. And sometimes when I present this, people say to me, well, Maybe they were just confused because they know there's lots of numbers in these scenarios. And we think that that's likely not the case. So we included some control questions. So would you save one person or 10 plates, for example? And some kids did pick the plates. So we exclude those children from the analysis and the, um, the pattern of results doesn't change. And I think also if we look at these one-to-one -one dilemmas, we can see here that in the absence of numbers, when they're just comparing one person to one dog, adults are choosing to save the person almost all the time. Whereas children are choosing to save the person about a third of the time. The, uh, the dog about a third of the time and saying that they can't decide about a third of the time. So it really does seem that in the absence of numbers, children are much more willing to move these animals closer to the center of their moral circles than adults are. We've recently replicated this study in Poland, um, which I'm really excited about. So again, Polish um, adults tend to prioritize humans over animals much more than Polish children. Um, there were some slight methodological differences here. So we used Lego and we had chimpanzees instead of pigs, but overall the pattern is exactly the same. And we're currently writing up a paper where we've replicated this in Spain and again in the United States. So um, it does seem to be coming out in multiple different countries now. Uh, as I mentioned before, we've also looked at this in the context of artificial intelligence. Now, also for the sake of time, but also because um, you're going to be hearing about this soon, I'm not going to talk about this. So this is some work that Gracie Reinecke will be speaking about in a couple of weeks at the AI Empathy um, Symposium. And but just to flag, this is a very similar pattern that we see for um, children and AI as well, where children seem to be more willing to grant moral consideration to artificial entities. So to recap what I've talked about today, I'm really interested in this question of variability in our moral circles. I hope I've made the case for you that moral circle expansion or our moral circles are shaped by both target and judge factors. So both of these things are really important. Historically, the field has been very heavily focused on targets, and this is really, really helpful information. But I think going forward, if we really want to understand the moral circle fully, we also need to spend time understanding the role of the judge and also this judge by target interaction. So how these two factors interact together. In my work, I seem to be finding evidence that children are more morally expansive than adults. 
Um, so that is they're more willing to put particularly these distant entities closer to the centers of their moral circle. Here we found this in the context of distant people, so people who may live far away or who are very different from you, of non-human animals, and again, as you'll hear about in a few weeks, uh, with artificial intelligence as well. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about this work, but of course it, it raises a number of open questions, and I thought that given that we're on a panel format where there's lots of capacity for discussion, I might end on a few questions. Um, so I think there's a lot of questions that come out of this, of course. Why is it that children's circles are more morally expensive? Is it something, is this reflecting their genuine views? Is it something about the way we're measuring these, um, these, these attitudes? So what is actually going on here? When does this change across development? So there's some really fantastic work, for example, by Luke McGuire and Nadira Faber, looking at children's attitudes towards animals through the teenagers. And they actually seem to find that teenagers have less moral consideration for animals than do adults and children. So there's sort of a U-shaped curve there. Um, but I think most of the, the children that we tested in these studies were up to about the age of 10. And so there's a really interesting open question about, about what happens between 10 and 18 years of age that children's moral circles seemingly contract. And of course, within that, what are the catalysts for change? If they are contracting, what is it that's driving it? More generally, I'm interested in this question of who else might have a broad moral circle. So Abigail Marsh, for example, has some fantastic work looking at um, people who've donated their kidneys to strangers. Uh, so these extraordinary altruists. I have some ongoing work looking at children who've become vegetarian and meat-eating families, and also people who've taken um, the Giving What We Can pledge to donate at least 10% of their income to effective charity. So what can we learn from these people who out in the real world appear to have these very expanded moral circles and a lot of moral consideration towards distant others? I'm really interested in this question of what we're actually capturing when we're measuring moral concern. So is the kind of moral concern that I'm thinking about when I think about a caterpillar or a pig different than the kind of moral, moral consideration that I think about when I'm thinking about a dog or a person that I meet on the street? And how do we think about these different kinds of moral concern when we are making these judgments? And of course, uh, the really important question is, what is it that we can do to facilitate moral circle expansion? So is there some way in which we can encourage people to expand their moral circles outwards uh, to, be, to uh, integrate more beings? So thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you, of course, to, there's many, many people to thank, but these are the co-leads and lead authors on all the projects that I talked about today. Of course, to my fabulous postdoc advisor, Paul Bloom, who is, is really wonderful in helping support all of this research and the Actress Foundation who funded my postdoc. And of course, thank you very much to Daryl and the Consortium on Moral Decision Making for putting this series together. Great, thanks, Maddie. That was a fascinating talk. Um, the, one of the last things you raised was really fascinating, this idea that like what kind of moral concern when you begin to think about other entities, like does it the qualitative kind of concern you're expressing towards something like a non-human animal or a, a robot? Um, I've often wondered this the, with this question of if, we, if, we, if you ask someone to extend empathy towards an artificial agent, for example, how do people conceptualize that ask? Like, do they think of what you're asking them to do in, under a different lens? So I'd just be curious if you had any thoughts or speculations about that. Yeah, so I guess I should start by flagging. There's already some really great work going on. Um, Charlie Crimston, Josh Rotman, and some colleagues are looking at distinguishing, for example, between moral rights and moral obligations. Um, and I think this is really important. That's some ongoing work. But I think for me, the, the question really, I think, is nicely characterized by thinking about something like, if we think about the moral circle, we tend to see, for example, that inanimate objects and insects are on the outskirts of the moral circle. But we also see, for example, that villains, people who've done the wrong thing, so child molesters, terrorists, for example, are also put on the outskirts of the moral circle. And to me, they're, they're there for very different reasons. One is because the judgment is kind of morally irrelevant. A chair doesn't have any capacity to suffer or it doesn't deserve any moral consideration. Whereas in the context of people that we've seen as having done the wrong thing, we're thinking about them as, you know, we want them to suffer or they don't deserve moral consideration because of the bad thing that they've done. And I'm really interested in this discrepancy and what that could mean about the kinds of ways in which we want to measure moral consideration. Um, I don't have a good answer for you yet, but this is a project that I'm currently working on um, where we're starting starting with a bottom-up approach and just trying to understand, you know, what are the relationships between existing measures of moral concern? How do people think about these things? And so hopefully if you invite me back in a year or so, I, I might have some answers. That's great. Thanks. Um, I don't know if Linda or Evan, if you had, happen to have any questions, then I can open it to the, the Q&A chat. Um, I was curious if you want to speculate at all about what you think is going on in adolescence. That's a very great question. Um, I actually don't have a lot of good speculation. My my sense is teenagers have a lot of feelings. They're pretty angry. They have a, like they they seem to be generally they have a 
I don't know if self-conscious is the right word, but they tend to interact with the world. And I can certainly speak to family members and what I was like as a teenager, where they, they really seem to struggle to feel good about things and feel good about themselves. And so I wonder if it's something like, well, I don't want to be seen as saying something is positive here, or if it reflects something genuinely, like genuinely lower rates of moral consideration. But this is something that I found the literature is really, really sparse on. So if you have thoughts, this is one of the things I was hoping to, to hear from other people about today, because it, it's such an interesting and important question. It might be that their teenagers are, are also kind of narcissistic, um, that they're very self-focused. And maybe the more that you're focusing on yourself, um, there's less room for consideration of any kind. That's really nicely put. Yeah, thank you. I think that that seems very right. I have questions, but I'll give uh, people in the chat a chance to ask theirs first. Well, uh, building off of Linda's question, there's a couple in here about developmental trajectories. Uh, Lisa Silvestri is asking about, you know, whether there's a sort of identity maintenance differentiation thing happening. Do, do, do adolescents develop an identity so they distinguish themselves? Um, and so the circle kind of contracts for that reason. And then one of my colleagues here, Sean Laurent, asked about... Um, is it possible that the shift in children's moral circles coincides with when adults tend to judge them as more morally culpable if they cause harm, i.e. when they like begin to grow up and have more responsibilities themselves? Um, I can't really speak to the first thing. I think it's a really interesting proposal, but I'm not aware of any data that could, could speak to it. But for the people out there that are doing this work, it feels like something that's worth exploring. Um, my sense for the second question is that it actually probably happens a little later. So we test children up to about the age of 10. And my understanding is that I think children around a, a bit younger than that are kind of really able to understand concepts of moral responsibility and they are often held accountable. So if you think about the playground, things like that, you know, it's, it's very much the kind of thing that you shouldn't be bullying or hurting other people by that point. So my sense is it probably happens. Um, you take on your own moral respons responsibility a little bit earlier than I think we're seeing this change in moral consideration for distant entities. But it's a, yeah, it's a neat question. So a couple of other quick ones. Um, Paul Conway asked about whether the circle of moral concern you think maps up, maps onto a circle of justice, people, children, adults hold responsible for acting morally as opposed to receiving help. So just to make sure I understand the question you're saying, is, is the tendency to grant moral consideration widely kind of does this map onto your notions of justice in a wider sense of like, well, we should care about all of these beings? I think it's primarily, um, as the question is framed here, um, I think how we how we think about the assignment of responsibility, basically. Oh, right. So yeah, responsibility for acting morally as opposed to receiving help. Um, I actually think that vulnerability, this is something that I haven't got a lot of hard data on, but it's come up as a bit of a theme in some of my work, which is kind of almost the opposite of what's being proposed here. I think in in some way, yes, being held morally responsible for something and being able to suffer are probably linked. I know that there's a bunch of data that suggests you can only either be, you can be a, a victim or a perpetrator. But I think a really interesting con uh example of this is in the context of artificial entities. We seem to, we would normally think that agency is relevant for moral responsibility and patiency is relevant for moral um, moral patiency. But it, it seems that for uh, agency, robots also have, or AI also seems to have to have some capacity to suffer or some capacity to, sorry, to experience. So I think these two things are generally kind of housed together. Um, but I would imagine that there are also cases where that breaks apart. So think about a fetus or a person in a persistent vegetative state. These beings don't have the capacity to have any moral agency in toddlers is, is another example, but they are more, how, they are considered quite morally valuable by many be people. So I don't think it's necessarily um, in all cases, but there are certainly cases where these two things would be entwined as well. So there are a few more questions. How about... Um... Two more that are sort of about the data. There's a couple that are about broader intervention, like longer term questions that perhaps we can save for the broader discussion. Um, but uh, Gracie Reinecke, who you mentioned in the talk, is asking, um, she remembers you not finding an age effect in the Wilkes and Caviola 21 paper, but how is this looking in the multi-country replications? 
And any insight into potential age effects there, particularly in light of the U-shaped curve you mentioned towards the end of the talk? Yeah, so we generally don't find any age effects. So I think the, um, the most recent studies have still only tested children up to about the age of 10, and we haven't found any evidence for age effects at that point, which suggests that whatever is shifting tends seems to be happening after the age of about 10 or 11. I know uh, Luke McGuire and Nadira Faber's work do, does find differences between, I think, 11 and 15-year-olds. So that's where you to start, start to see these trends. So it, it seems to be older than 10. And the last sort of data focus question, and then we'll, we'll switch over to Evan. Um, so Catherine Francis asks, uh, what are your thoughts on the interaction between moral identity and moral expansiveness? There's some evidence to suggest that if being moral is core to someone's identity, this predicts a wider moral circle. And how might this map onto the moral development literature? Yeah, so I think that this is a really cool idea um, and definitely something that I think is worth exploring. I'm not familiar with the work that shows that link, but definitely something I need to read. So uh, Catherine, I'll be emailing you about that. Uh, but I think if, if caring about or being a moral person is a big part of your identity, it's likely then that you're going to be somebody who does think about these things. And, and this is a kind of segue into a discussion about, you know, the role of emotion versus the role of reasoning in these kinds of moral expansiveness judgments. But if this is something that is very important to you and something that you care about a lot, then it, it's likely that you would be able to kind of override or push through beliefs that people, other people might have about uh, not granting moral consideration to others. And so I think that having a strong moral identity would likely be, and it sounds like it is predictive of having an expansive moral circle. Makes a lot of sense to me. Great. Um, well, well, thank you for uh, taking all these questions. I mean, I think it is fascinating to think about um, just in the, in the broader question of motivating empathy and concern. It, it is a lot of interesting, fascinating work in developmental psychology as you know, kids' motivations to expand their empathy and concern seem to change in nonlinear ways over uh, lifespan development. It, it is it raises a lot of interesting questions about where the sources of those motivations come from, from parental socialization or other sorts of influences. Um, and some of the last questions we'll get to in the discussion that sort of, I think, touch upon some of that. So, yeah. And uh, for our last speaker, um, let me introduce Evan Westra. Uh, Evan is an assistant professor of philosophy at Purdue University. Um, his work focuses on the philosophy of cognitive science and moral psychology with a focus on social cognition, theory of mind, how we judge character, and social norms. Um, he received his PhD in philosophy from the University of Maryland and was a postdoc at York University and an SSR, SSHRC postdoctoral fellow at U of Toronto. Um, he recently published an edited collection called Folk Psychology, Plur Pluralistic Approaches. Um, and is published on animal normativity in biological reviews, and recently on non-human norms in the philosophical transactions of the rural society, as well as work in the journal Cognition. Um, so yeah, a lot of the the work that I've seen has you know, touches upon many of the discussions we've been having both you know this year and in this panel, but also we've talked about empathy for humans and animals and in previous iterations of expanding empathy as well. And so I think just some nice connectivity across uh, several. Uh, versions of the series. So uh, whenever you're ready, Evan. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Daryl. Daryl, thank you for organizing this great session. This has been a ton of fun already. Thanks to Linda and to Maddie for great talks. Uh, so um, I don't have any data. I'm a philosopher. I'm going to be presenting some theoretical work that I've done jointly with my colleague, Daniel Kelly, who's also at Purdue University. Uh, and my talk is why moral progress is annoying, affective friction and changing norms. And so I'd like to start with um, uh, by having us all think about a type of experience that I think is familiar to most of us. If you haven't had this particular kind of uh, this particular experience, you've had one like it. So uh, I'd like you to imagine that you're at dinner with some friends and uh, maybe you've just ordered a burger. And then other people at the table start asking about plant-based options. And the conversation turns to how several of your friends have decided to go vegan, how they're concerned with animal rights and so on and so forth. And you roll your eyes and go, Ugh. and you are just, 
so annoyed, you know, enough with this vegan stuff. It's so preachy. You just want to enjoy your burger in peace. Um, now, keep in mind here, it's not that you don't care about animal suffering, right? Like in some contexts, you, you care quite a bit. Uh, if you saw a dog locked in a hot in a car on a hot day, you'd feel this instant burst of compassion and moral outrage. You'd break the window and free the poor dog uh, because, you know, you're a good person and you're an animal lover. Uh, but when it comes to conversations about veganism, you just don't have those same emotional reactions. And in fact, you know, all this vegan stuff is just hard to take seriously when it's just so kind of preachy and moralistic and annoying. Now, I think this is a pretty common experience, maybe not about veganism, the details might vary. Um, when we're told that something that we see as ordinary is actually wrong and that we might need to change our behavior, very often our first reaction is to get kind of irritated and dismissive. You know, if it's not veganism, maybe it's about how someone's told you, you need to take fewer flights and fewer vacations to cut down your carbon footprint. Maybe it's about being told that you can't use certain words anymore because they're ableist or otherwise offensive. Some people get upset when they have to share their pronouns. Again, it's not that most people don't care about right and wrong. It's just that for many of these ostensibly moral issues, they, so for some people, they don't immediately feel like matters of right and wrong. And I think that's because most of us have this expectation that when you know we're confronted with genuine moral issues, when morality is really at stake, uh, we'll know it. We're gonna feel these moral emotions, like a flash of righteous anger or a pang of compassion. But when we're confronted with a potential social change that doesn't feel that way, and it kind of just feels like tedious and annoying, we take it as an intuitive sign that, well, you know, maybe moral issue, there isn't a moral issue at stake here after all. So call this, if you will, the eye roll heuristic. If it feels preachy and annoying, it's probably not morally significant, and it's safe for us to ignore it. So I don't think anyone really explicitly ignores, endorses this heuristic as articulated, but I do think that we implicitly rely upon it quite a bit in our day-to-day -day lives. And I think that this is a, poses a significant psychological obstacle to moral progress. Because I would argue, often morally important social changes do not elicit those standard moral emotions uh, like outrage or compassion, not for everyone. Instead, they make us roll our eyes. And so what I suggest is that we should actually expect that most genuine moral progress will feel annoying. Uh, so, and that's because uh, in this paper, uh, Dan and I argue that our emotional responses in these situations, they're not driven by our capacity for empathy or by something like a moral sense. Rather, they're the products of uh, what a number of authors have taken to calling our norm psychology or the, psych uh, the uh, psychology of norms. Now by norms here, I'm just ta I'm talking about that set of social rules that guide our everyday behaviors and that tell us uh, which actions are permissible, which ones are impermissible, and which ones are obligatory. Some of these norms are explicitly articulated uh, you know, rules like no hats in church, no gum in class, you have patriarchal norms like ladies first. But then a lot of these norms are implicit and unspoken. Norms about like how close you should stand to someone when you're talking to them or which subjects are suitable to bring up in casual small talk with an acquaintance. And so our norm psychology, as uh, I'm discussing it, just consists in a heterogeneous cluster of emotional and cognitive mechanisms that help us to follow and learn and enforce these rules. And um, I've argued in several places that this uh, involves uh, quite basic affective learning processes like reinforcement learning and habituation. And so over the course of our day-to-day -day lives, our norm psychology tunes our affective responses 
to the particular set of social norms that governs our local environment, social environment. And this means that for most of the time, taking the normatively correct course of action just feels, uh, feels right and intuitive and natural. The thought of doing something else just barely occurs to us. And, and deviating from the norm would feel weird and kind of anxiety provoking. We also tend to have very strong negative emotional responses when we encounter norm violations, even when they're relatively minor. Now, when everyone is attuned to the same set of social norms, this is actually a really good thing. It facilitates fluent social interaction and coordination. And so in our day-to-day -day lives, this often works so smoothly that we barely even notice the multitude of norms that are around us. But things feel very different when you find yourself in an unfamiliar social environment. Uh, governed by a different set of rules. So if you have ever been a foreigner, if you've been an immigrant or a, a tourist, you kind of know what this is like because you find that all of your social expectations are slightly off and somehow everything can feel slightly more awkward and anxiety inducing. Uh, in a word, social interaction becomes disfluent. Uh, my personal uh, uh, the example of this that resonates the most with me is um, every time I go to Berlin, I somehow manage to wander into the bike lane. And before I know it, I have German people yelling at me. It's, it's a very embarrassing experience. So Dan and I call this phenomenon affective friction. And uh, this occurs when your norm psychology and the norms you've internalized in it have become misaligned with the norm prevailing norms in your social environment. And so this means that your various social intuitions about what you ought to do are miscalibrated and it makes you worse at navigating social interactions. Um, you know, if in your home environment you're on autopilot, well, affective friction knocks you out of autopilot and you start to have to devote significant cognitive resources to tasks, everyday tasks that would normally be automatic and habitual. And this feels lousy. It feels kind of annoying. So our central thesis in this paper is that people often experience a similar form of affective friction when the norms in their local environment start to change. Because if your norm psychology is effectively tuned to a certain set of expectations about the world, well, sudden changes to the social environment can throw you into misalignment and lead to feelings of awkwardness and irritation. And so this, I think, is at the root the, uh, of why we find uh, norm changes so annoying and why we're just at this very basic affective level intuitively inclined to dismiss them. Now, one context where you observe this a lot is when you see people first adjusting to the use of non-binary pronouns like they, them. Now, this is such a minor change, but it's a really morally important one. Uh, but a lot of people have a hard time with it. And so their initial response is often to get kind of frustrated and dismissive. And so this is a great illustration, I think, of how it, it only takes a small change to throw people into misalignment and create affective friction. And so we think that this basic kind of affective response kind of sows the seed, psychological seeds of broader forms of resistance to norm change. Of course, this isn't the whole story because these feelings of disfluency and irritation are further exacerbated by a number of factors, like when norms are enforced through corrections and criticism and social punishment. Uh, now that sort of basic affective friction starts to transform from just irritation and awkwardness into like embarrass embarrassment and shame and maybe even anger. Things get even worse when a new norm spreads unevenly in a population. Because often, you know, norms will get adopted by some subgroups first, while other social groups kind of lag behind. This is just a normal part of norm diffusion. Um, and so this is especially clear in intergenerational contexts, when younger people can often act as a kind of vanguard for social change, while older people uh, can uh, be reflexively resistant.
And so when a new norm is mostly being enforced by members of one subgroup on another, then these experiences of effective friction can drive uh, backlash and conflicts. Because in these contexts, the new norm isn't just annoying, it can actually become a sort of threat to your social identity. And this can lead people to double down on the old norm as a sign of in-group solidarity. So I, we think that all of this should be of great concern to anyone whose goal is to bring about moral progress on a societal level for the simple fact that widespread moral progress requires widespread norm change. And so this phenomenon of normative misalignment and effective friction and this risk of backlash makes that task very challenging. And so would-be norm changers need to find ways of mitigating affective friction rather than exacerbating it. Uh, how to do that, uh, I have no clue, but here are some kind of optimistic speculations. One thing I think uh, worth looking into is trying to figure out how we can alter the normative uh, or the emotional valence of normative change. Uh, one idea here is to think about ways we can get people to approach new norms with an attitude of curiosity. Because so research on curiosity shows that when people's goal is to explore the world and to take in new inf information, we tend to treat novelty as intrinsically rewarding rather than as aversive. Another thought is to look to contexts where we voluntarily suspend our commitment to norms and let ourselves pretend that the world works in a different way and allow us to sort of try on norms that we don't normally abide by. One kind of context that we normally, uh, where we do this as children is through pretend play. But uh, the philosopher T. Nguyen thinks that we also do this when we play games as a way of experimenting with different modes of agency, of uh, experimenting with ways of living uh, that are different than the ones we currently inhabit. And so the question here is how might we use contexts of play and games to help us uh, help people get used to and learn new norms? And finally, just on an individual level, I think that we probably need to be less quick to dismiss moral arguments just because we find them annoying and irritating. And I think that, you know, whenever we feel that kind of reaction, we feel that eye roll brewing, we, we need to take a beat. We need to ask ourselves whether this reaction is reasonable or if we're just reflexively relying on something kind of like the eye roll heuristic. So to conclude here, uh, what I've argued is that I think that moral progress requires norm change. And the problem here is that norm change can often cause this misalignment between our norm psychology and the social environment. And this creates this affective friction, um, which uh, leads us to react dismissively and defensively to positive, otherwise positive norm change, and it can snowball into backlash responses. And so, you know, would-be norm changers need to seek strategies for mitigating affective friction by changing the emotional valence of normative learning. Uh, that's all I have today. Uh, if you have any questions, you want to follow up about citations, you can shoot me an email. And uh, you can keep an eye out for me and Dan's essay on this topic, which is going to be coming out in Eon Magazine pretty soon. Thanks. That was great. Really thought provoking. And thanks, Evan. I'm already seeing connections across the three talks and trying to formulate a coherent question. Um, I think one thing that I thought was really interesting um, just this idea that expectations of deviations of norms, like as norms are changing, the expectations of the deviations from your current sort of ecology, the sort of expect the eco ecological rationality you've developed about like how you're living in your current environment might seem to impose like a resource demand. And it just made mm -hmm. me think of like how we, and going back to questions about how we anticipate like effort and like the need to manage ourselves in a changing environment. Um, and how that can also balance with if you have a strong like moral conviction 
Like, I guess, so there's like two questions here, actually, sorry. Um, one is like how we think about the connection between the norms you're talking about and the strong moral convictions that Linda was talking about, where I feel like those, there might not just be the expectation this is difficult, but also if you somehow change your own conviction to meet the changing environment, there's all, there's a separate pressure, which is that people who also hold your same conviction that you currently have would somehow punish you in a different way. And so I guess it's, it's a two-part question, like how we think about managing that anticipated effort, but also how you see the relationship between the norms you're talking about and some of the more explicitly held convictions that Linda was talking about. Yeah, good. I, I mean, I think that sometimes, you know, I mean, one thing that's really interesting about Linda's results is showing how, you know, we tend to try, like to affiliate with people who share our moral uh, moral convictions. But I think in practice, what that does is it creates a kind of scaffolding that makes it a lot easier to sort of interact uh, in ways that align with those moral convictions, you know, to hang out with other uh, with other vegans, to hang out with other uh, with uh, other other people who show, share your political views. And um, that can then kind of make it quite natural and intuitive to express uh, express these views sort of within that uh, sub community. Um, the kind of, the question is like when you want to like expand some uh, like spread some of those uh, when those moral convictions lead you to think okay we need broader forms of social change like we're vegans and uh, or we think that we need to change our practice about eating meat how do you change practices among people who don't share your convictions how do you sort of change people uh, people's day to day habits and sort of coming at it head on with like sort of uh, by sort of trying to enforce these norms can have these backlash effects. So, um, Linda or Maddie, did you have any questions for Evan? Not to put you on the spot. Um, I, I think it's, um, Evan's description of what happens um, is a really interesting one. Um, yeah, and it's something we haven't studied is how do people react to people who are pontificating about their moral conditions? And I think that's a really interesting interesting question, especially if those moral convictions are non-normative or at least for the perceiver. Um. So one thing I'm really interested in, as I mentioned, the developmental trajectory, but at the moment I'm working on a project where we're also looking at the moral circle across like adults and older adults. So this is an upcoming project. And I wonder sometimes if the answer is, and obviously we can we can get data to look at this, but it's not necessarily that your own moral circle changes, it's that societal norms change and then whatever was acceptable when you were forming your moral views is no longer acceptable. And I was wondering if you could speak to that in the context of your approach and your thinking. Yeah, I think that's right, because um, so uh, the philosopher uh, Christina Bicchieri, uh, she has this great 2017 book about norm change. And um, one of the things that she points out is how, you know, uh, very often um, people can have like fairly strong and clear moral uh, moral beliefs about whether certain behaviors are right and wrong, but um, they will kind of persist in behaviors they personally see as immoral because they think it's sort of normally prescribed in their community and because they're very uh, sensitive to the kinds of feelings of like shame or embarrassment or ostracism that might arise when you deviate from those, uh, when uh, you deviate from social norms. And so you get these situations where, you know, um, sometimes it's known as pluralistic ignorance, where, you know, everyone can actually know that something is wrong, but the norms kind of cause, uh, cause you to do it anyway. And so, you know, the challenge then is, um, okay, well, how do you create a social environment, a normative environment that sort of, al uh, that aligns with the, uh, you get the social norms to align in a way with the sort of these moral ends? And how do you sort of, uh, how do you uh, initiate that shift? Um, and, you 
it's not necessarily a matter of changing hearts and minds. You can sort of, uh, that is not necessarily sufficient, but then because people are strongly motivated to coordinate, strongly no uh, motivated to conform to the existing social norms, um, that can sort of make it, uh, make it easier for people to start to adopt these attitudes after the fact. So we have several questions that are coming in, um, many of which build upon some of our conversation already. Um, oh, this is going to be interesting. So, okay. So trying to combine a couple, um, I think, so just looking at, so Josh Rotman says, really interesting talk, um, trio of talks, um, has the intuition that annoyance is unlikely to arise in some response to some morally important social changes, in particular, people who have existing moral convictions that are directly opposed to socially progressive ideas likely feel other kinds of emotions. The kind of affective friction that gives rise to annoyance seems to be a defensive realization that belies as perhaps implicit realization that the social change is morally superior and that one's own preferences are mostly just self-interested rather than morally correct. Would you agree and might annoyance be a more fragile form of affective friction than other forms of negative emotional reactants? Um, great, uh, thanks so much for your question, Josh. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's sort of layers to this, right? So there's this sort of basic layer where you're just sort of uh, encountering novelty, uh, like uh, where the environment is not as you expect it to be. and that's sort of creating creating this basic kind of disfluency that creates like awkwardness and, and annoyance. Um, but I think like when you kind of expand the social context of it, you know, and you start to see, okay, well, the norm is being enforced by uh, uh, enforced by others, and so you're being shamed for viol uh, for violating the norm, or you're embarrassed. Or when there's this out, uh, there are out groups, you know, maybe out groups you don't like particularly much, who are the ones enforcing the norm that. Um, that can start to um, create take this sort of very basic kind of uh, friction, this very basic affective response, and sort of build it into much stronger reactions. Um, like if you if you if the norm is being enforced by an outgroup, and you see that as a, you experience that as a threat, as a threat to uh, to your in group, um, well. And, uh, you know, and if the, this happens in a context of where, you know, groups are pol uh, polarized anyway, then this effective friction is just sort of more evidence for uh, the sort of polarized attitudes. So I, I totally agree. Like this is sort of the thin end of uh, effective friction is the thin end of the wedge. But I'm kind of interested in these cases where, you know, like changing your vocabulary is a little bit or change or uh, just changing the way you talk where the change is so minor so like uh is so cost free in a way like just use they them pronouns it's not a big deal but it can still sort of get this like disproportional disproportional reaction that can snowball into uh greater forms of hostility so um Building off that, another question by Jason DeCruz, a former Expanding Empathy uh, guest. He asked, do you think there's anything different between recalibration to quote unquote progressive norm change versus calibration to norm change in a reactionary direction? Uh, no, I think that this is a phenomenon that should be uh, applied to any kind of change. Um, you know, if the, if the, uh, misalignment is just okay. Any time that the norms that you have internalized that uh, are internalized in your norm psychology um, are miscalibrated with the norms in the environment, you're going to get these feelings of affective friction. So there's sometimes like the affective friction might um, uh, might be the product of like norms going in an anti-progressive direction or cha or changing for the worse. So the claim isn't that look. Um, affective friction is actually a sign that things are getting better and you're just resisting a positive change. It's just that it's not a it's just not a reliable guide to morality one way or the other. Um, and so so as like a uh, and if you agree with the kind of basic premise that look whites uh, kind of 
widespread moral progress is going to involve norm change, is going to involve changes in social environment, then that is also going to trigger some degree of effective friction. So there's a nice question here. I was considering saving it for the broader discussion, but I think it directly pivots off what you just said. So, and it's kind of pitched, I think, for all three of you. So it's Anastasia Karlovari, um, who is asking how you define moral progress. Does it imply expanding moral circle or moral consideration? Uh, Anastasia is also very interested in what Linda said earlier about living in a highly moralized time and what determines that. Sort of, are there certain periods that are more versus less moralized? So, um, so yeah, what is our phrase? What is how are you defining moral progress? So, I think that this phenomenon that I'm talking about in this talk is going to be a challenge, regardless of like which uh of how you think about what moral progress or what would constitute moral progress, because uh, if you think of progress as change as a sort of change uh, change for the better, and this kind of change is going to imply norm change, you're gonna see this phenomenon. Now, as it happens, like the kind, you know, the examples that I sort of um, led with in this, in this paper are maybe a hint as to what I'm thinking about as to uh, the context that matter a lot to me. So uh, contrary to my first exa example, I am in fact, <laughs> uh, I am in fact a vegan. And I do think that like a lot of, Sort of irritation and resistance to uh, to adopt uh, to changing norms around how we treat animals uh, do seem to stem from uh, some kind of affective friction, and so that's something that I think about a lot. But in principle, my the way I'm presenting these ideas are supposed to be uh, remain neutral with respect to the sort of substantive moral concerns that you might have when pursuing moral progress. As a follow-up to that, and when the current um, discussion about legal access to abortion in the United States being an example of affective friction, um, and both sides see their angle as moral progress. Yeah, absolutely. So let's see. Um, there's several additional questions. Let me... Um... There's a couple that are one, one thing that stood out to me was this idea of like curiosity and openness. And I think there's a broader, I mean, several psychologists doing fascinating work on humility and interest and openness and a lot of these more positively oriented cognitive dispositions that might facilitate sort of empathic approach. Um, Alessandra Massa is asking about the role of novelty. And so sort of the novelty sort of factor and how we think about how people either respond with friction or not. And Meltem Yussel is asking about humility and curiosity and kind of going back to an earlier question that came up with, I think, Linda's talk, like how do we, how do we maintain an attitude of humility and curiosity, especially when we have these strong identities, strong group identities involved? So I guess the roles of novelty and curiosity and sort of how we balance those. Yeah, good. So in the kind of longer version of this talk, something that uh, Dan and I consider is how, you know, there might be like important individual differences in like experiences of affective friction um, and whether or not you're inclined to respond to novelty with sort of irritation or with, uh, or with openness. And I think like, you know, like open, you can think of openness to experience as a sort of broad personality factor that um, seems to predict like how people, how much people expose themselves to novelty, like whether people like, uh, you know, are enjoy travel or sort of trying, uh, trying out stuff from new cultures, whether or not uh, it actually, um, uh, vegans tend to have <laughs> greater openness, uh, levels of openness to experience. Um, and might think that there are these individual differences that sort of incline us to either treat novelty as rewarding or to treat it as aversive um, at a very at a very basic level and that this can then uh, this then shapes the kinds of choices that we make in our lives and the kinds of norms that we adopt or our willingness to explore um, alternative norms like one interesting phenomenon uh, 
I don't have the reference off the top of my head, but uh, students, college students who do a year abroad tend to come back with higher levels of openness to experience. And so there's something to be, uh, there's something about like exposing your, intentionally throwing yourself into a culture where there is a mismatch with the, uh, with the local norms uh, that sort of increases, it can increase your tolerance for, uh, um, for novelty and uh, for your ability to experiment with different, uh, with different kinds of norms in your day-to-day -day life. I can just add to that, we have some data showing that people who've taken the Giving What We Can pledge to, to donate their income to effective charity tend to be higher in things like actively open-minded thinking. So got some, some data to support that as well. So a couple of more questions for Evan that sort of, they're about the, instead of like how we get past the friction, more of the cause of the friction. Um, so my colleague, Sean, is curious about why it is that even discussing one's own norm when it counters someone else can create friction. Um, sometimes it seems there's a lot of intolerance for even hearing that someone's norm is different, even when not explicitly imposed. And um, Paul Conway is asking about, is it the norm, it, is it, is it the, not the norm itself that's the issue, but the fact that it's the person raising the norm and any perceived ulterior motives on the part of the conversation partner in raising this? And so is it, is it more of a, about the, I guess the pragmatics of that conversation and the person mm -hmm. rather than the norm shifting? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, so there's a lot of work seeming to show that like we tend to be kind of suspicious of do-gooders um, and that, uh, so I mean, to speak to uh, to Paul's question that there's um, that, you know, because sort of, um, because there is like, are these kind of status benefits or these reputational benefits that can accrue from sort of being perceived as having a good, uh, as having, a good moral character. Um, there, uh, people have reactions that are sort of, sort of guard against that. And we sort of, uh, and so we're suspicious of people for engaging in things like virtue signaling and for kind of abusing moral talk for the sake uh, for uh, the sake of atta uh, attaining higher status. So there's definitely uh, so it's definitely true that there are often just these responses to. Uh, to people or, or like the, this is sort of part of the negative response that you see to someone who is uh, engaging in this kind of moral, uh, who's like maybe imposing a new norm that you don't like. And it's like, okay, you start to kind of elaborate. You have that feeling of like, mm, that's annoying. Why is that feeling annoying? What are they trying, uh, what are they trying to do? So, I mean, I think that those are kind of pressures that sort of push in the same, <laughs> the same kind of rather unfortunate direction that, uh, not only are we sort of averse, uh, can we be averse to change and we feel these effective frictions just from encountering the new norm, but then we're also kind of often vigilant, like morally vigilant for things like for uh, virtue signaling. Um, and uh, that can, uh, those two things can together push away from uh, uh, adopting the new norm and have the same kind of backlash effect. And I think that um, you sort of answered uh, Corey Cook's question about whether threats to identity are part of this too. I think that sort of wraps into what, some of what you were just saying. Um, the main last question that I have for your talk here is it's sort of a, a, another one that sort of pitches to all three of you and maybe that's a good time to pivot over to the more general discussion. Um, so Bev Conrique is says fascinating talks, question is broad. What are your thoughts about the interplay between moral convictions, norm change and group identity? Bev's hunch is that the eye roll heuristic might happen when someone else is espousing their moral convictions on veganism or the like, unless um, the topic, unless the topic that's being espoused is at least someone relevant to a perceiver's identity. So trying to think, so again, just continuing on the, this point about moral conviction, group identity uh, as an obstacle to, or moderator 
accentuator of sort of the norm change effects you're talking about? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I mean, my sense is that if there's a kind of norm change that's seen that's experienced as reifying your group identity or is seen as sort of positive and supporting your group identity, that that can go a long way towards um, towards overcoming the hurdle of effective friction. Um, so it's sort of converse point to the idea that if uh, a new norm is seen as a threat uh, as a threat to identity, that that can sort of increase backlash. So another sort of way of thinking about uh, how do you kind of uh, how do you achieve sort of progressive norm change uh, in the face of these psychological obstacles uh, like effective friction. Well, just as we should be thinking about ways to map and mitigate effective friction, thinking about ways of sort of diminishing that kind of sense of threat, and, uh, giving people ways of um, understanding the new norm in ways that align with their uh, align with identities. Maybe that's a little too optimistic, but I think that's sort of given that we we know that threat to identity can be such an obstacle. It's at least worth thinking about how do you diminish that threat to identity. So um, yeah, and I think that that definitely at the end of your talk, like how how do we use um, curiosity, open mindedness, creativity to sort of think creatively, change our expectations about what it means to go along with norm change and think about new ways of appraising the environment. Um, yeah, so we have about 25 minutes or so. Um, if anyone else in the audience has questions for all three speakers, um, and if any of the, our panelists have questions for each other, uh, we have a bit of time. I think there's, it's an interesting, having talked about moral convictions and the, you know, these deep seated uh, beliefs about which, you know, what specific things are moralized, the expanse of the moral circle and how it can contract and expand for different targets across the lifespan. And then, you know, these more subtle kinds of norm change that people are sometimes recalcitrant to. Like, I think it's it's interesting to think about the different layers of, of moral progress and change that we've been hearing from today. And so I'm just, if any of you have questions for each other that, um, I'd like to follow up on the um, last question that was posed to Evan. It's it's just talking about it maybe using a slightly different language. Matt Feinberg has a um, theory of attitude moralization um, in which he talks about push and pull factors, um, where the push factors are pushing towards moralization, but the pull factors are reactance factors. And yet what you've um, what we've been talking about here are really a couple of um, pull factors. And um, one. I would just use slightly different language to talk about them. That if um, you're someone who has a really strong preference, um, for example, for you see gain a lot of hedonic value from consuming meat, um, that you're going to have a lot of pull factors in terms of how strong that preference is. So strength of initial preference is probably going to be one predictor of um, effective friction. Um, but if you, you're already in the domain of convention, um, you're probably all tied up in terms of um, this is how people in my group believe, and you're going to see it more as a, a threat to group identity, um, which is a different kind of pull factor, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think that maybe um, the pull factors are stronger in the domain of preference because um, you don't have any moral recognition. It never occurred to you that eating meat might be bad, morally bad. And so it's learning that someone has good reasons for thinking of it in moral terms could be really threatening in terms of your sense of moral authenticity. Um, and therefore the reactance factors are particularly strong. And I, I guess I'm, I shouldn't underestimate the group effects either, but the, I don't think we're used to thinking about um, hedonic relevance as a major resistance um, factor in thinking about morality. Thanks. Yeah, that's a really interesting way of framing uh, framing this. So, and yeah, I, I I like the idea of like kind of mapping it onto the different uh, to the different domains. So, um, whether you're encountering effective friction uh, 
or whether you're being sort of challenged on uh, something that's just merely a personal preference in the personal domain versus being challenged on something uh, something that's uh, that's in the co conventional domain and how that might so the underlying motivations for why you adopt those behaviors are different and so the kinds of reactions you have might be uh, might be different too that make that really makes a ton uh, a lot of sense to me i mean i'll just say i'll, I'll say one thing anecdotally about um not eating meat is um you think it's a preference and then <laughs> you try to <laughs> you try to not do it <laughs> and you realize that like how much the environment is sort of invisibly structured around it like you know name name a holiday and i'll name a meat dish that you're supposed to eat and you know um and we've all if you are uh, a vegan, you've probably had your fair share of uh, very sad roasted vegetable sandwiches in cardboard boxes at conference lunches. Um, and uh, if that's not a source of affective friction, I don't know what is. I think there's probably two pathways to <clears throat> becoming a vegetarian or a vegan um, that may, may provide some insight in terms of just the processes involved here. Um, I don't think, for example, simply informing someone about the harms of consuming meat is going to be sufficient to overwhelm the hedonic preference for meat or, you know, embracing the normative practice of eating meat. I think you really have to, um, it's going to take a lot of cognitive work to even accept, fully embrace the harms that are being done. But without the recruitment of some emotional weight to that, you know, being able to recruit some disgust to eating meat, for example, um, without that, it's going to be very hard to persist. Um, so th I think there's multiple steps involved in terms of embracing that particular norm or a norm that's as strongly hedonic as like meat consumption for most people and, and it's heavily nor normative. There's going to be a, a rather elaborate process to persuade them to get off of it. Um, with the exception that some people can um, path to veganism and vegetarianism is probably a, a intuitive and affective, that they viscerally have a reaction to the idea that eating meat is gross. Um, and inappropriate. And that pathway is almost instantaneous. Um, and we all know somebody who's got a kid who just really rejects the notion of eating meat very early. Um, and unpacking that is um, certainly um, something for future research. Uh, I'd be interested to hear any of Maddie's thoughts on that issue. Um, about, the same uh, in terms of the circle of moral regard. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is definitely something that I've thought about. So I have an, an ongoing project. We're currently analyzing the data. It's been four years of collection. So it's a really, really slow where we look at how children, um, differences between meat eating children as compared to children who are raised uh, as vegetarians. So vegetarian and vegetarian families versus children who are independently vegetarian. So they were raised in a meat eating family, but chose to become vegetarian. And this work has really just been kind of the initial steps of looking at other kind of personality differences or differences in their traits that might explain this. Um, I don't have any results for you yet in the child sample with adults. So this is like adults who became vegetarian as children, so a retrospective adult sample. I think we found differences on uh, measures of speciesism of, uh, so they were lower in speciesism, lower in social dominance orientation and higher in empathy, um, which is obviously very relevant to, to the panel. Uh, so it does seem like there's some sort of personality differences that might be related to, but of course, when you're looking at this retrospective adult sample, it's very hard to make any any claims about anything causal, right? Because it's just looking back at uh, like looking back at a decision. So I'd be very interested in trying to understand these pathways. Uh, as Linda was saying, I'm I'm really interested in this distinction between people who make the decision really slowly and sort of seem to like anecdotally, I know people who are uncomfortable about meat consumption for quite a while, and then they're often there's some kind of like social facilitation that happens in their life that allows them to then become vegetarian versus some people who, yeah, you know, they watch a documentary and the next day they're a vegan. And I think these two parts are really interesting, but I don't have a lot of sense of, you know, it seems that one is more effective and one is more kind of cold, slow and reasoned, but I'm really interested in why some parts work for some people and not for other people and why some parts don't work at all. And yeah, where this, this variability comes in. And I should just add as well, in the context of children, it does seem like, and, and one of the things that I think might be happening with young kids is they, young kids seem to kind of really love animals, but a lot of them do eat meat. And I know that uh, Luke uh, McGuire and Jared Piazza have some really interesting 
a kind of a really interesting paper that kind of discusses the lack of knowledge about food systems and how that interplays with children's attitudes towards animals and sort of how they learn to integrate these things, which which could answer actually the teenagers' questions that came up before in terms of this sudden drop in moral consideration for animals. But it feels like because society, as we've talked about, is set up to hide the fact that, you know, hide the way we treat animals, this isn't something that most people want to deal with. It's much easier for young children to avoid that information. Um, and then over time, they kind of come to learn what really happens. And I think that's a really important learning experience for kids and seeing how they react there probably feeds into one of these pathways. So a lot of this conversation is um, feeding into um, one. Of, so one of Linda Trevino's questions was broadly about interventions to increase moral concern. And I think, you know, it's trying to think about how to you know, integrate the three different constructs you're talking about is is fascinating. I mean, if if we think about, you know, how do you take how do you take a child who's, you know, learning about the, the you know rights and responsibilities of others and like maybe not fully, you know, even admitting individual variability and differences across particular children, you know, they there's often, you know, as a as a, as a parent myself, I can, you know, there's the kids definitely they don't always agree with you and they like they'll they definitely will raise lots of friction. Um but I thinking about how to translate like sort of the environments that, that Evan was talking about, like where, you know, trying to navigate, adapt to a new environment, change from an expected regularity to something new. Um, and then it kind of allowing oneself to be open to that possibility. And then maybe allowing for some of the, the piggybacking that Linda was talking about, then bringing in emotion and then developing something like expanding the moral circle and then developing it into a particular conviction about a particular entity and whether it's susceptible to a particular rule or, or moral right. I guess I'm just, I'm trying to, it's it's interesting to think about the pathways between these. And I would just, if, if any of you saw any further connections between um, mechanistically how these three things interrelate, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking a lot um, about the relationship between norm change and empathy. Um, so I wasn't talking a lot about norm uh, empathy in my talk, but I suppose at least one, on you can think about like maybe how do you discover the need, uh, how do you engage in moral discovery? Like, how do you discover the need to expand the moral circle um, or that, that it ought to be expanded more broadly? How do you become like attuned to injustice and harms in the world that you didn't notice before? And I think of empathy as a way of kind of building those more, uh, as uh, building those moral convictions that the way that individuals can, uh, can do that and can engage in that sort of moral discovery. But that's a sort of individual level process. And that, I mean, partly, I mean, I've been very impressed by some of your work, uh, Daryl, on how, you know, empathy is sort of hard. <laughs> like we need to, it, it takes effort and we need to be motivated to engage in empathy and not everybody and uh, not everybody is. And so in that sense, it's, it's not as real as reliable as a tool for sort of instilling widespread changes. And what I find, what I'm drawn to with the norms literature is we're so strongly motivated to conform to norms and to whatever they are. And uh, that those motivations can overwhelm our, our, our moral convictions. And uh, that, and so you might think that if empathy is a tool for sort of moral discovery and thinking about how do we need, uh, like, what direction do we need to go to seek out moral progress? Um, you have a different, potentially a different set of affective tools when it comes to actually implementing that progress or cha or changing norms to to bring on board people who aren't aren't empathizing, who don't who lack those moral convictions, but might be motivated more socially. I mean, the, the role of norms is fascinating. I mean, we we have some. Um they done a couple of papers that people who think that others choose empathy and choose to cultivate moral emotions like outrage more, they do it to the extent that they think others do it. There's a correlation between people putting themselves in situations where they can cultivate these moral emotions um, to the degree they think others do. And they also find it easier. So that if they think others do it, they themselves find it easier. It's all correlational. 
but it raises this interesting question, you know, if we were so attuned to norms and we, we've come to have certain expectancies and that makes where we direct our moral, uh, our moral resources, um, it feels easier, um, then being asked to redirect would ostensibly feel a bit more effortful, much less if as many questioners have raised this question of identity. And if you, if it's deviating you from a group identity or a moral conviction about which you already have a strong sense of compunction and to which you have to further consider the factor of, well, if I change my belief about this, others who still share that belief, there's a, there's a social punitive sort of cost that I have to factor into that calculus as well. And so it, it is interesting to consider how we, if we can use empathy in these contexts, how do we balance the felt difficulty of kind of using it in this space? Um, other questions that we still, I mean, some of them we've touched upon already. So uh, Paralof Wickstrom had asked about the role of motivation and moral conviction. Um, I don't know if perhaps, you know, one way to take that question beyond what we've currently discussed perhaps could be, you know, how we choose to deploy our convictions, like how, how, how does motivation shape our, shape our convictions? I mean, a lot of the work that you presented, Linda, was about how moral convictions can have downstream effects on activism. But perhaps if we think about this question of friction and also how we convince others to expand their moral circles, any further thoughts about the relationship between moral conviction and motivation? Um, yes. Um, just some of our other research has found that um, obligation um, is a major factor, you know, that explains the motivation for um, moral convictions. Um, that moral convictions are associated with really intense feelings of obligation to act. Um, so I, I'm, I'm assuming that that's where the motivation really comes from, is from that sense of should and ought and obligation. Um, which I think would apply to the uh, moral circle as well, to the extent that we have an obligation to expand our moral circles, or we perceive that we have an obligation to expand our moral circles, the more likely we, we will. Um, this is slightly to the side, but I think there hasn't been a lot of work on kind of interventions to actually expand the moral circle. I know James Kirby has some work showing that uh, sort of compassionate meditation intervention can work um, over a, a couple of month period, which I think is really cool. Um, and I think it's a really important and as we've all flagged, extremely difficult question. Um, I think thinking about the role of social norms and uh, people who you identify with and if they're changing their norms as a potential way for you to change your own feels important. But and and maybe this is a too skeptical of a view, but here we are. Um, I think there are some cases as well where I th we do need to make that moral change not necessarily need to be difficult moral change. So I've had an op-ed drafted for years and years and never sent this off where I kind of try to make the argument that we should stop, for example, trying to get people to um, care about animals so they'll stop eating meat. And instead, we should get them to stop eating meat so they're able to care about animals. And so if we take something like cultured meat, which is an area of research that I do, if we were to introduce a way for people to continue to do the behaviors without the moral harms, I think what you would see there is an increase in moral consideration for animals because there's no longer a threat to your identity or your how you're feeling when you're, when you're engaging this behavior. And so this is the non-psych answer and maybe not that helpful here, but I think it's also worth flagging that sometimes we also need to think about ways to change the environment for people. That's reducing a barrier. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting to think about. If, if, if we think about interventions at a more structural level, changing the choice environment, changing how people, changing the situations people find themselves in, if we were worried that moral convictions might, in some cases, leave people awry, or we worried that affect or friction might be enough to dissuade people from further engaging or being creative and exploring an environment, then yeah, I think that is interesting how to set up environments in a way that helps people get past some of the tendencies that moralism might otherwise produce without like normatively judging it as problematic or saying it doesn't matter, but perhaps just sort of letting people have more options with more uh, calibrated environments. Um, and yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. 
And just to add to that, I mean, there's lots of different ways of thinking about shaping the environment. So one is like, okay, like have uh, cultured meat or your Beyond Meat alternatives, or or like just make it easier to to uh, easier and tastier to be <laughs> um, a vegan and like changing the physical environment like that. And but then you you might think that also, you know, the changes to the social environment and changes to uh, and uh, changes to you know our sort of uh uh the attitudes that we have around the uh, these things like um you know how we like how normal <laughs> we see it for people to not be eating meat and like to uh or how no uh and creating social scaffolds for uh, to make it easier for people so that like uh, i mean i guess this is the word of like inclusion right like how many uh how can you change the environment the structures on a physical level and on a social level to make it easier for people to adopt new moral norms and adopt new moral convictions instead of having to like go it alone and uh you know just uh adopt a moral conviction just through sheer force of will, even with all these headwinds in front of you, how can, uh, there are a lot of ways of making it that easier for people. So we have a couple minutes left. Um, I think if, does any, do any of you have any further questions for each other as we close out? Can I ask my question to Maddie? Go for it, yeah. Um, Maddie, I was interested in uh, this finding about how um, uh, it seems like adults uh, think there's less of an obligation in uh, this sort of Peter Singer pond style, uh, style scenario. And they think that uh, distance, social and physical distance, both diminish uh, diminish obligations and children don't. And so the the way you describe that conclusion is like, okay, children have a broader moral circle. But um, I feel like there's a certain amount of like information that adults have about like how hard it would be <laughs> or what are the sort of practical implications. And I'm wondering if like what you're seeing is not necessarily a difference about like what, what it would be good to do, but a difference in sort of a knowledge about like what uh, the sort of practical side of things. Is. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, we did try to control for that in the study. I didn't go into the details, but we kind of say, you know, here is a way that you could easily equally help somebody who's far away or somebody who and or somebody who's close and things like that. But of course, that doesn't mean that children and adults will believe that just because we've told them it's true. So that's a potential explanation. Um, I would say that uh, Julia Marshall, my collaborator, has other work and in our work a little bit as well. We see distinctions between obligations and expectations. So while children think that we are less obligated to help people who are distant, I'm sorry, while children think we're equally obligated to help people who are distant from us or in her work, there's um like other kinds of social distance as well. So whether they're strangers or friends, they do expect that people will help them less. So it's not that they're not aware about these differences. It's just that they don't seem to factor into their moral judgments. Um, but I do think that there is some truth to what you're talking about as well, where like the sheer scope of what that obligation can mean might be a little bit more distant or abstract for children. Um, so I'm currently actually doing some work on trying to manipulate things in to being concrete or abstract in the way that we present information to see if this pulls intuitions around. Um, but generally, I think that's one of the factors that probably sets apart some of children and adults' judgments. I also wonder if it's not um, just the sheer number of obligations. The children don't have very many. Um, you know, even within their, their narrow or um, circle of moral regard, but adults have so many. Um, and, and, the, and their various different roles that the idea of adding on a, a, a really distal one is, is going to be perceived as much more co costly to an adult than it would be for a child. Just in terms of how, how many obligations you're starting out with. Yeah, I think that makes that makes a lot of sense. I guess the rebuttal to that would be that these do vary, like we we see the effect regardless of if it's a first or third party judgment. So that softens that a little bit. But I think that yes, adults are more aware that other adults also have these obligations. Um, I'm guessing that if you were able to manipulate something like that, like how much did this person already do, you might then see some kind of uh, shift in judgments as well. <laughs>
Although I could also imagine children saying, well, if this person already does a lot, they're already a good person. And so there'd be some kind of moral consistency effect where you'd expect the good person to be obligated to do more good as well. So it feels like a really cool thing to test. Well, we're up on one o'clock Eastern time. I'm mindful of everyone's time. And I think this has been fascinating. One of my, one of my favorite, when I, when I teach moral psychology, I always have a week on this sort of question, like moral norms, convictions, moral circle, and sort of the malleability question. And um, yeah, I think this has been fascinating to think of, to think through like the practical implications of changing moral perceptions and norms, um, but also different interventions, strategies, mechanisms, um, some of the challenges. And, you know, many of the people here were asking about the relevance of this for like the upcoming election, but also clearly connecting it to various other real world ethical concerns. Um, thank you, Linda, Maddie, Evan. It's been fantastic to have you here. Um, anybody who didn't have their questions answered, please um, do reach out um, to the speakers. Um, we'll post the recording a little bit later. And for those of you who are interested in the question of expanding moral concern to AI agents, we do have a thing next Tuesday. It's a hybrid event. So if you're in Pennsylvania, stop by, um, but it's also online on Zoom um, of several speakers, including some of the data that uh, Maddie was alluding to. Thanks y'all for being here. Thanks so much, Daryl. This was great. Thank you. Thanks for having us.